Folks, welcome to an on-site edition of the Jake Feinberg Show here at the Marin Rod and Gun Club and uh, joined today by a, a sound legend and uh, a great musician in his own right, Dan Healy. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, glad to be here. I'm glad to have you in our one of our private but most cherished and loved areas. Um, I just want to go back. Can can you talk about to the audience worldwide, people tuning in? Keep the comments coming, and I just want you to talk about the legacy of John Cipollina. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, you uh, what form of legacy you might you're looking for. Uh, and, and there's, a, you know, I've had a hard time uh, figuring out who the first rocker. The rock, first rock guitar player in the psychedelic scene here in San Francisco was uh, Jerry Miller, uh, Ch Cipollina. I'm sort of trying to. Most of those cats, Garcia and those cats, came from the folk scene. Yeah. So John I'm just did not come from the folk scene. John was a rocker right from the get go, and he was in uh, uh, a band called the Chord Lords, and in 1962, 61, 62. And he never was uh, from the folk scene. Almost everybody else in the scene, uh, Kantner, Garcia, David Freiberg, uh, uh, the sort of the rudiments of all of the bands uh, in the Bay Area really came from the, the folk music scene. And uh, they were all like sort of uh, children of the Kingston Trio. And uh, so uh, um, the uh, actual hard rockers or the rock, not, uh, the rockers, were Link Ray and those kind of people who inspired people like like John, and that's who he really was uh, enamored of, and, and probably who was a model for him. So John was an honest, legitimate rock and roll guitar player, and then he got involved with the, the folkies, and and it became what they call and still call folk rock, which was a. a a kind of a moniker that always didn't seem to express very much, but it's, it's like a <laughs> like a dumb bumper sticker. It seems like it makes sense until you think about it, <laughs> and then it doesn't. Then you realize it doesn't make any sense at all. You know? What did he, in your mind, what did he bring, and how did he influence cats, folkies like Garcia and and and, and Freiburg and those cats? What did he bring that helped? You know. I think for one of them was the the knowledge of how to what a guitar electric guitar should sound like. Uh, the, mm, uh, mm. the whole concept of a twang and and all and and feeding back your amp and and all of that stuff. John played a guitar that you used to be able to buy for I think it was like seventy eight dollars in the silver the Sears catalog. It was called a Dan Electro, and it was like a beginner. I guess you'd call it a beginner guitar. It was a mail order guitar, and it had really cheap pickups and it was made of um, of this kind of particle board called Masonite. And uh, it was really the, uh, the bottom rung of the guitar ladders. But it became famous because its sound was so bad that it was good. I dig. And uh, it became... You called them bat twang, right? Well, they had kind of bat wings on them, although John was really... For some reason, John had... Some, John was, was, uh, was uh, fascinated by um, uh, a Dracula. Uh, <laughs> and what's his name? Uh, what's Dracula's real name? Uh, uh, I can't say it right now. Anyway, um, um, the fangs. Uh, the, the... So, so he he everything was like sort of bat bat wings for him and bat this and bat that. And I guess he probably would have been a Batman fan had he have been born later. Um, uh, although there were Batman comics in those days, but it was, but the the whole Batman craze and movies and stuff came after that. It is time. But uh, for some reason, he liked that. Uh, he also, he liked the kind of Dracula. Uh, 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 he, I guess he liked the clothing. He liked the long, he had long stringy hair, and he was skinny as a bean pole, and he always dressed in black. And, uh, and his clothes were always like thin and long hanging. And, and he loved that whole look. He kind of cultivated that look. And along with that, he always had a low slung guitar. He was also, instead of just guitar, like I play with my guitar practically up under my chin because I feel like I can control it better. But he's one of those guys that had it way down there. I never could understand it, but it's like anything else. If it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So he had, when you put that long stringy hair and his dark complexion 
and and his clothing and the low slung guitar with the, the with the bat wings on the end of it. Uh, uh, he, it really made an image and it created a whole version of a of, of persona that that kind of became the style of, of some of many players and, and there's many 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 young guitarists follow in the footsteps of the fabulous incredible John Cipollina. He you know did you know him what was he what was where was he at at the end of his life it seemed to me that uh, cats like Bloomfield and 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 Cipollina and John oh, not John Conn's a bad example but those cats I don't know, man. I, could you explain his mental frame and where well, he was? One thing uh, you should understand that John's uh, John lost his life to a childhood disease. Uh, he wasn't. He, he didn't OD. He wasn't a junkie, and mm -hmm. he wasn't necessarily particularly a druggie of any particular kind, any more than any of the rest of us. So, which means that probably fewer than twenty or thirty dump trucks of cocaine were snorted during our lifetimes. But. Um, um, he had a, uh, he, a, 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 a he was born with a, with a, a DNA situation that had a lung problem. He had his twin sister. She had problems too all of their life, and she now passed on that as well. But um, he, he amounted to mesothelioma, is what he died, mm -hmm. of. and um, he. It was something that that he was always what we all we called him a lunger. I mean, he was always he was always that kind of uh, not too healthy. He was the, the skinny kid in class that was always sick. Well, and Mario he, was saying he was like he had black lung on a on a on a houseboat, and, and uh, he was die. He was like in really bad shape uh, for yeah, a while. He was he he battled that kind of stuff his whole life. But as far as him, his personality, and as far as who he was as a, as a man, John was just a regular everyday guy. I mean, he to me was well for one thing he was near and dear to me and so i saw him as a as a really close friend mm -hmm. and someone i loved um but he, but as far as being um particularly uh, uh, eccentric or any of that I, I can't say that that he was was uh, unless i guess i didn't notice the, his penchant for dracula type stuff so i guess you could say he might have been a little bit obscure in that area but i didn't really see him that way because on a day-to-day -day basis, he was just an everyday guy, you know. And he was—he loved to play. He loved music. He knew the kind of music he wanted. He—he—he he, he knew what he wanted it to sound like. And that was something that very few of us really knew. When most of us started, uh, um, they most of us came from either folk or, or some kind of, of, of big band background. I grew up in a big band family. My mom was, as I, I've said this before, but my mom was a fantastic musician. She always had uh, small orchestras that rehearsed in our living room. She played in nightclubs and stuff like that. My dad was a great, uh, he considered himself an amateur or non-professional musician, but he was a great player. And uh, their music style was the music of the 30s and 40s and what it would be known as, or called euphemistically as big band music. But a lot of people came from the country and, and hillbilly background. A lot of people came from the folk music background. And, and the folk music was kind of a, uh, inspired in, by, to my generation by the Kingston Trio. The Kingston Trio, Dave Gard, one of the things that he did was um, he was really interested in world music. They were, the Kingston Trio was the first people that ever really delved into world music. Now it's real popular, and a lot of people do it now, but back in those days, that was considered really stretching out, and he got a lot of flack for it because it was a little bit outside of the ordinary. But he traveled the world and looking for, in fact, he's, you know, he spent most of the rest of his life, the last half of his life, in foreign countries, studying um, world music, and he brought it back. You look at all the Kingston Trio songs, they're, they're uh, most, of them are based on some foreign land, so. Were they incorporating that kind of uh, percussion into the music per se, or the, just, I mean? I, I think it was really the storytelling part that the, that the, the Kingston Trio was really, that, that made it the folk music thing, so. The conversation. Yeah, I guess you would say that, or the message, the, the, lyric, the lyrical message. The lyrical message. And, and uh, because they were all stories of, of folk tales. But they were folk tales from other than America, from all foreign lands and stuff. And so, with a, um, when 
uh, my generation sort of got out of high school or was finishing high school and finishing college and so on and so forth. Um, we we picked up guitars having listened to people like the Kings of Trio when we were in in, in younger years, and so we began. Uh, we also grew up on on people like Fats Domino and Chuck Berry and that sort of generation of, of 50s rock and roll. So the, the combination of folk music was really um, uh, uh, kind of country music and rock and roll uh, and with, with a, a great flavor of world music kind of thrown into it. And that is my definition of, of sort of folk rock. That's why I say folk rock doesn't really mean have a meaning because it doesn't really doesn't really explain what I just sort of ran down. Yeah, but yeah, but it, 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 unfortunately the labels and labels were not that prescient at that time. I mean, I, 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 I it depends on where you it depends on what world you were circles you were traveling in. Don't don't kid yourself. Uh, if you owned a radio station, you were put into a bag just by anything that you played on the air, and you either made money from it or you were ostracized and shut out from it. So. You know, you could, you could. It was, it was very a big deal back in those days. I look at Bob Dylan. I mean, when he picked up an electric guitar, the, the folkies wanted to lynch him. I mean, they literally talked about lynching him. <laughs> so I mean, what was it that he plugged in? But also, the the trap set really bothered people too. too. Well, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, I mean, like a, a Newport Folk Festival, he had a trap set there, and uh, Albert Grossman... Oh, the, a trap set. I, I, yeah, a drum. I'm sorry, drum. A, yeah, you said. a kit, trap yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that whole concept of electric guitar <gasps> and drums, <gasps> you know, that was like, wait a minute, man, you're supposed to be singing like Peter, Paul, and Mary. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 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 the times are changing, you know, and so uh, that, it, it, that's really... Uh, uh, a perfect example of, of you could be ostracized by having by, by changing or by stretching out in your music so Dan I wanted to ask you in our first interview you talked about this your ability to take what the Grateful Dead had in their heads and be able to translate it out the output of it sonically to the audience in a, in a, in a tra you were a translator in some ways um, I started out as a musician. I got in the scene, and I came from a musical family. I started out as a player, but I discovered early on that I had, for some reason, I was born with a God-given knack of understanding not only music, but sound and how the music translated into sound. And I also, a, 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 an electronic freak, and was born that way. Uh, my grandfather, who was a musician, um, uh, also was an electronics, he was early radio guy. And so I guess I inherited him, which I'm really thankful for. But the point is, is that early on, I, 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 I'm the first person to sit up and said no when, when we were in a studio or somewhere playing and somebody who was running the sound system had no concept of what was going on. I was the guy that sat up and said, wait a minute, that's not what it is. And, and because somebody saw me do that, it was like, okay, we want you to say how it is. So I became a representative uh, for the sound and recording, even though that wasn't my original intention, but that's how I got there. You told me that the first cat that really instilled that confidence or, or put that challenge to you was Garcia. No Do question you, about it. Can you talk about that conversation or more to the point when Garcia realized that it was your net, net, true nature? Well, I, you know, I can't speak for him because I'm not inside his head, but uh, what, what, what happened was um, there, the Grateful Dead had been playing the acid tests and was, uh, Owsley was doing the sound, but there was, there, was, uh, there was a point at which Jerry wanted to, I think, break away from the kind of concept that, uh, uh, that Owsley and others had that they were they were sort of being led into and he wasn't really he felt that it, it was distracting from his concept of the music is what he felt and uh, so what he did is that uh, he gave walked away from the the, the, the pre-arranged equipment and system that that had been set up, and he just went to a music store and bought a guitar and bought a, 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 a amp, and said, "I'm going to start playing this way from now on." And that's when uh, he there was really nobody there. Alzi took a, I guess, a, a little sabbatical from it. I, I'm not really. I, it doesn't really matter wh what all went on, but 
And nevertheless, I, I sort of was cast upon that scene, thanks to my pal John Cipollina, um, who, and I'm still not sure if I'm pissed on him or for that, or I'm happy. He foisted that on you? He, uh, well, that... because, because he was my pal. We ran together. We lived over here. There's a, there was, in Corte Madera, there was houseboats. Mm -hmm. We called the Corte Madera Slough. It's all been torn down and plowed away and returned back to so-called so Tideland, which is really a code word for clean up the water and build condominiums all around where our houses were. Right. Um, uh, but um, I, the house what I lived on with, belonged to a lady named Phyllis Heath, who was a marvelous artist and a fantastically wonderful person who in her own right was, was a, a frontiers woman um, based on um, what a woman was expected to be back in those days sure. and how far she went in, in, in the different direction. Um, and the next door neighbor houseboat was a houseboat that belonged to a guy named Bobby Collins, who was actually one of the first guys to ever put on rock and roll shows in the well, Fillmore, the original Fillmore and stuff. Oh, yeah. And Quicksilver was crashing at his houseboat. And so I started hanging out with, I mean, I had known John before that, but I, I didn't really, I, I, I hadn't really spent a lot of time hanging out in the music scene since, since John uh, got involved in that sort of psychedelic music scene. Uh, I, I was, I guess, a latecomer. I was working in a recording studio in San Francisco. Columbus Recorders? No, I, it, it was uh, before Columbus Recorders. It was a commercial recorder. Com 53 you started there, right? Uh, 63. 63. Uh, a, a place called, uh, uh, a guy named Lloyd Pratt, who was a fantastic jazz bass player. He was Downbeat Magazine Bass Player of the Year for 53, That's I think right. 53 and mm. 54. Anyway, um, so I knew about electronics, I knew about sound, and, and uh, I worked in a recording studio. So these guys were always hitting on me to come to see, hey man, you gotta come and see one of our gigs. They would always hit on me to work on their equipment and stuff, because in those days, nobody had any money. And so if an amp broke, that was disastrous. You know, you, nobody had enough money to feed themselves, <laughs> let alone take their amp to a repair shop, right? So um, I got kind of conscripted into, the, into Dano's amp repair service. And so John was always after me, come on, you've got to come to a show, you've got to come to a show. And so I went to the uh, old Fillmore at a show that Bobby Collins was p producing. And the opening band was the Grateful Dead, and Quicksilver was the headline band. And uh, there's a whole lot of other stories I don't want to go into now, but some great stories about the girls' camp and, uh, and Olima and, uh, and places like that. But that's for another time. Okay, someday, yeah, sure. No, someday just, we'll have just, just a fun, we'll do, we'll just hang out. I'll, I'll, I'll tell a fun story. I can't wait. But uh, I got to the show with John, and uh, the music had stopped, and something had happened on the stage. Uh, an amplifier broke, and like, like I said, nobody had spares. Even if you broke a string, it was a drag in those days, let alone a broken amplifier. So uh, uh, it was like, is there a doctor in the house? And Chip Lena <laughs> pushed me, literally, physically, wow. pushed me up onto the up forward, up to the stage, and goes like that, fingered me. And so I went up on the stage, and I twitched with something, and got it to work, and uh, the band started playing. I sat down on the back of the stage, and after their set was over, um, Jerry came up to me and introduced himself and said, hey, I want to thank you uh, um, th for lending a hand and helping us out here. And so I uh, said, oh, okay, you know, um, I wound up going up into the dressing room uh, up over the stage in Fillmore, if you've been there, in these little decrepit little rooms. Up it was the old Fillmore. Over, yeah, the original old Fillmore. And uh, I shot the shit with... Uh, Jerry, and I never did hear Quicksilver play, I just sat in the dressing room and shot shit with Jerry. But one of the things is being accustomed to working in the studio and listening to monitor speakers and having control of the sound and stuff, um, this, in those days sound systems were called public address systems. There was two little speakers, one on each side of the stage, <laughs> and it was, you know, the you know, famous fat lady <laughs> asshole. Yeah. Right? And, um, so I made some comment about, geez, it's too bad you can't hear pig pen singing and stuff, you know. You know, you just hear the music, which far and vastly out, out, out um, or drowned out the, the vocals and stuff. So Jerry said, hey, you know, if you have an idea, you should do something about it. And so I got together a system. There was two weeks away. There was another show there. I went and, uh, and procured through some, at the time, nefarious means, 
uh, um, uh, I, I shuffled some pot and stuff like that and got some money and uh, went to two different sound rental agencies and rented a ton of equipment, piled it up on the stage and the Grateful Dead played and you could hear Pigpen sing and play harmonica and, uh, and that was sort of the beginning of what became history. Were all were all the vocals of the band diminished? Like, could you hear Jerry at all, or was it just? You couldn't hear anything. You couldn't hear anything. No, it was it was like a little. It was like a transistor radio oh. on the side of the stage. It was, it was bleating away, and with no possible ability to understand what was coming out of it. Um, and so <laughs> you, that characterizes it. So so you you're catching a hang with Jerry, and he just says, "You got something? If you want to, you know, put it cook, put it together." And so you came back and and yeah. And, yeah, he encouraged me. He said, "Yeah, he he said that. He yeah, he said I would like to see that." And 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 the other thing is, is that that that's when I I really that was really at the end of me, um, the end of me as a musician in, in the most professional sense, and the beginning of me as a, a record producer and sound engineer uh, in that sense. Because, I, like I said when, at the opening of this, I originally started out as, as, as a musical person. But because I had a sense, I knew just from the from I guess from being brought up with musical arrangements and stuff, and, and that that you arrange a tune instrumentally so that it 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 it, it, it surrounds the vocal, and so I have a, I had an in, innate sense of of how it all should fit together, and it was just like bleh on the stage, and, I, and so my job was like, can I take bleh and sort and sort it out, I love and it. put it into a presentation, and that in a nutshell is kind of what what happened. And so um, I just spent the rest of my life um, trying to figure out better ways to do it. And I made it. I mean, by the mid-80s, um, I, it sounded like I, it, it sounded like it was supposed to sound. I, I, I liked, I was happy with what I was, I was never satisfied, but I was happy with what I was doing. I mean, for somebody that never saw the band, which is Jake Feinberg, I, and I live on audience recordings from the early 80s, it is the most power, part of the visceral nature, it's not even the quality of the musicianship, it's the sound that's coming out. It's burning. It is burning. And so you, you're telling me that you didn't get that to the point where you were remotely satisfied until the mid 80s that was uh, yeah i didn't i i didn't it wasn't until let me just go back and say that uh, when you start learning to do something that you've never done before, and this is not only is me, but this is all the members in the band. Too. Sure. None of us knew what the band was really going to wind up sounding like. None of us knew where we were going. We only, at best, you, when you start a journey, the best you know is where you're coming from, and maybe if you're lucky, a little bit about where you're at, <laughs> but you not necessarily know anything about where, where you're you going. going. Okay, so. Um, it was a matter of that, so it, it had to take shape and form. It's like a, a, a newborn child. It's nothing until it, it, its character is a product of its life experiences up to any given point. And so that was really hmm. how how the Grateful Dead progressed, and not just the Grateful Dead. That's how we it. it that's how life progresses. And so as it progressed, it became. Uh, uh, the, the, what is, what is, the less used to have a saying, the faster we go, the rounder we get, or some dumb saying like that. But it, it, it was it tantamounted to meaning um, you 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 get what you, you see, what you get after you get what you see. You know, so it's like the circle, the, the vicious circle, um, uh, and it was, it was a humorous way of looking at it. But um, uh, we, when you learn to what you want to do, and you learn or you're pursuing what you want to do, and the, and the more you do it, the more you learn how to do it. But not only that, the, as you're doing it, the more you learn what it is you're doing is really looks like. So you begin to get, and that, and that term is called perspective. All right, so it was perspective that brought us to the mid 80s where I, it was like, okay, Everybody heard the song. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe I, they heard the song the way I heard it, or I heard the song they heard it, sure. or maybe we all heard the song the way we each other all heard it. But well, however you want to, to dissect that, um, the one song came out of it. Um, the one thing that's missing uh, in all the tapes and all the recordings is there were moments uh, in Grateful Dead history. I'd be at shows. And I'd be standing beside, by the way, the world's most fantastic 
lighting director that ever walked the face of this earth, Candace Brightman. Um, I need to talk to her, man. You need to. She's to take a little sidetrack. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. I want everybody to to look her up. She has going through. She's losing her vision, and that's for someone like her. That's like. Worse than me losing my hearing, which I'm doing, but that's another story. Um, uh, seriously, um, she was she had she was the me of lights, and that's one of the things that was miraculous about the the me of light. You said, yeah, yeah. I did. Oh. Uh, she uh, and we both had we both were those people, and it made it. We ran the Grateful Dead as much as the Grateful Dead ran us. I mean, it was a two way street. Absolutely, there were moments. I've been at, at shows, and then somewhere in the middle of the second set, I would look over at Candace, and she, she, she there's a, there would be times during the music where you could hear a pin drop. Now, I know that's like asking what the sound of one hand clapping is, but it's true, and anybody that was there and witnessed it will testify that I'm, I'm speaking truth. There was a time during the music you could hear a pin drop, and I say that by means of meaning the attention of the audience was so unified, so one, and uh, of all of us, that there was silence in between sound. Pure, there was utter silence between sound. That is like a nirvana in a funny Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Um, and there would be times like that, and I would look over at Candace, and that's another thing. We didn't have to be prompted to look at each other. We would sense something would be on, on our skin, and we would look over at each other, and she would look at me and say, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And I would go, yeah, I am see are you seeing what I'm seeing? She would go, yeah. And the whole place was time stood still. And it was just outrageous, okay? Uh, many a times that happened, and that's the experience that was at the end of the cultivation of all of this stuff. And, and that began happening um, on, on, on a whole audience-wide level by the 80s. Uh, and before that, there was random moments of, of stuff and lots of individuals being stoned on LSD and lots of psychedelic experiences and stuff. But this one, trans... trans what am I trying to say? Transcended. That's right. It's a word I use all the out, time. Yeah. It's, it's it all right, Healy. This, this transcended drugs. Mm -hmm. It transcended all. It transcended all facets of social uh, intercourse. It, 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 it was something that never happened before, and it was something that I've never seen ever happen anywhere else. Oh. I think that they didn't have. And I, 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 what I'm saying is they were all big personalities. So the idea that like you came in, Jerry, it, did they did they just did each of them say, oh no, I need more bass or I need to hear this more? I mean, how did you how did you translate the collective sound in order for the, it to resonate with the audience? Because when the band was in the right frame of mind, it was all it was all that powerful collective force. Right. Well, I, I can tell you this is probably going to raise some hackles. Oh more. boy. But uh, for me, it, it, th this all happened when the band would just shut up and play. Exactly. And, all right, and don't interfere. Stay out of this. This is beyond your ability. Don't meddle in this. This is a higher thing that's happening here. You play your music and let the rest take. Let let let, let the rest carry on. You told Garcia that you play. I I yeah, I, I, you, I mix. I don't tell you how to play. You don't tell me how to mix. But I never had to really tell Jerry that because Jerry was one of the ones that was perceptive enough to see that to be it from the get go. Uh, right from day one, when he challenged me, he must have seen something. And uh, Jerry was a mar marvelous, marvelous enabler uh, from an artist artistic point of view. Uh, that's why I wanted to see him uh, move, go into the movie. He thought that the, the Grateful Dead was was menial compared to what he could have done in, in other areas. But, you know, that's another conversation. That's sure absolutely. No, I do want to talk about, like, the case in the, the early stuff when... You know, with Merle and Jerry and John Conn, we've never talked about that. You were you you were the you were on tour with Legion of Mary. You'd mix those all the all those shows. And I things? didn't do. I, no, I was never really that much of uh, in the Garcia band stuff. Oh, really? I did some off and on, and I would fill in for people. But in those days, I was also producing other bands in the studio, and I had my own band and music scene. So when the Garcia band started happening, I had the Healy Trees band. This is what I wanted to talk to you about, because this, this is, talking to Dan Healy here, who's just a ridiculous musician, started with guitar, 
played bass with the with the bicycle and then went back to guitar. Um, but you told me in our third interview, you said that uh, you had two rules. You wore two coats or two, you know, two jackets. One when you were doing the sound, but if you were performing, you'd leave the sound to the intimidated, quaking in his boots sound guy because you knew that it was a scary situation. But I was thinking on the on the plane flight out here, I said, "There's no way that you just by osmosis learned." Did you learn that the hard way? Did you try to meddle at some point with the? No, what happened is that just being, doing the sound, the first thing I noticed is the first time, the first time I wanted to kick someone in the balls right. was when some musician who was just had no idea what he was doing lipped off to me about something that I was doing in the sound. And then I realized, it's like, wait a minute, um, you know, you're, you're on the stage, you don't have any idea what I'm doing, and yet here you are lipping off to me. You know, um, I realized that you can't, you, you can't produce yourself. No one can produce themselves. What you have to do at some point when you're endeavoring to, to, to stretch way into the creative arts world is you have to do what you do without looking back and without looking outside. And so if you're meddling in, in the lights and the sound and the this and the that and another thing, then you're not, you're not, you're not delivering your art. So in order for me to do what I do as a sound mixer, the musician has to do what he does as a as a player. So that I I I noticed that I mean right out of the gate. So because of that, when I play, I I shut out all that other stuff. I play and play for myself and play for the audience. I I mean I I think of myself as. Uh, I, I, I I love singing. I think about how I'm phrasing it, how I'm uh, uh, in my intonation, how I'm pinching off words, the difference between consonants and vowels, and all of that. That kind of stuff is going through my head. The playing me strikes a note, and I envision my note going off out into the audience. And what happens to it? Is it crashing into the walls? Is it going out and settling? Is it pleasant? Is it doing this? Is it is it saying? Does it have the emotion I want it to have, or is it? Have some other emotions, so I'm deep into 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 the nuts and bolts of how the structure. If you took and took apart everything I was doing, those would be all the little. That's the tinker, the the, the Lego set with all the pieces on the table. And then you put it together, and it's a it's, it's a man playing me and singing music. But if you take it all apart, it's just a pile of Lego pieces. Absolutely, but I just like when the bicycle was cooking at its finest. And you wanted to hear a tape of the show, and the guy mangled the board. You never, you always held back because you knew. Well, you you can't. You, you, for one thing, it's water under the bridge. You can't turn the clock. Absolutely, back. So but the ego gets in there. Yeah, that yeah. Is 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 a, is nonproductive and it's stupid. So so that alone is 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 a clue. But um, no, what's done is done. I, I, what I did more likely was I longed and ached for the 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 night I could play it, hear it back, and it was all there. <laughs> That's the one I I dreamt, I dreamt of and held my breath for. Okay, I wanted to hear me the way I wanted. I I always wanted to be. Um, uh, mixed by, by when I'm playing, I would like to be mixed by someone that's as good as a, a mixer as I am, or mixed by me. <laughs> now, and that's that's the, again, that's the sound of one hand, the tree, the tree falling in the forest, right? Absolutely. Uh, so <laughs> there's no way of really knowing that. But, it, it, but the point is, is that you can't really do that. What you, all you can really do as a player and singer is play and sing. All you can really do as a mixer is mix. All you can really do as a lighting director is direct the lights. Um, we each and all, every one of us can only really do well what we're doing and by taking on the responsibilities or the weight of other facets of, of the combination, you're just defraying the, the, the outcome of the one. Talking to Dan Healy here at the Marin uh, Rod and Gun Club here, uh, such an honor. And uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, the one thing we haven't talked about, uh, I, I, went, I met with Michael Mondavi yesterday and Coppola was spinning pizzas at, his, at, at Robert's place, so they were very tight. Uh, uh, Coppola was also uh, very close with, uh, the, with the Grateful Dead. And, uh, and I wanted to ask you about your involvement uh, with the Apocalypse Now sessions, well, because because Arico, who I just talked to, Arico was great. talking about. Yeah, I mean, he would. They you wake up at, at mm -hmm. any god given hour, there'd be percussive instruments all over the place, mm -hmm. and 
They, but, but, but somebody said they'd start recording. It was Healy that started the recording. Yeah. Um, that, Talk about Coppola, your, your relationship with Coppola, and then also that, that, the Apocalypse Now sessions. Well, I, I only met him, and I can't really say that we're good friends. He wanted to, at one point, he wanted to do a Grateful Dead movie. Um, but that fell through, it didn't really wind up happening. But um, really, I have to say that the credit goes, if it's credit or shame or whatever. Yeah. No, the credit, no, it's good, man. The credit goes to Mickey Hart. Mickey Hart, right. Rhythm so, Devil. Uh, but Mickey is, is not only, he's another person that really was intrigued by world music. Yeah, absolutely. Only from a, he was more into the rhythm of it. A minute ago I said that the Kingston Tree was into the lyric and the storytelling. Well, Mickey was literally into the, into the movement of the emotion of the actual sound of the instruments and the rhythms and stuff. And he's been all over the world studying that and he drag, drags home instruments from all over the world and he's got in his studio um, he's got a, a world-class collection of, of, of uh, rhythm instruments. It's just staggering. But Mickey is, is a game guy. He is, is driven by the eternal dissatisfaction of the status quo, like myself and, and other ones of us were, and which, which spontaneity and, and, and that drive uh, sort of led us to, 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 to down the path that we went down. Right. So... He was always, uh, he, he had no knowledge of recording and, and, and electronics and stuff. So he was always, uh, uh, I, he had picked me to be his, uh, his, his sort of uh, helper. He had other, I wasn't the only one, but he was always hitting on me. He's, I got this idea to do this, let's go do this. He always wanted me to go to Timbuktu with a portable tape recorder or this or that, or, <laughs> or, or, or microphones in the bottom of the bay, um, recording the, the clack, clacking of clams or something. Uh, no, cause yeah, that, he would have, if you didn't have to go back and finish Shakedown Street, he would have dragged you off somewhere in uh, Egypt yeah, somewhere, you know? Right. That's right. And uh, so th when, so Mickey is really the one. When we were in negotiations with Coppola for a, a possible a Grateful Dead movie, uh, Mickey kind of singled him out when, when he discovered he was making the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Apocalypse Now. And he, he, Mickey saw the travel down the river as a whole other... He, he saw it in a different light. He saw it from from maybe an African or or a, an Asian or something, but definitely not as as, a, as an American soldier. He didn't see it that way. And the story was kind <laughs> right. of being told. Right. It's told from the point of view of an American soldier and about a maniacal colonel who set up shop and ran it and ran his own government uh, out in the middle of nowhere, right, or out, out in the jungle. So uh, Mickey saw, he saw the sinister aspect and the, the scary, frightening aspect of, of it. And so he, the trip down the river, he was commissioned by Coppola to create a, 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 um, a texture, a mat. A sound collage. A co sound collage. Um, that would would change and, and sort of go and fit the mood of the different machinations and, uh, um, uh, 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 and the various trepidations of, of what was going on. I can't think of the name of the word, but um, the, the word meaning traveling. Um, You're popular. No, the, the, we're, yeah, we're uh, Dan Healy, very popular cat here on the Jake Feinberg Show. Um. But no, but the, the thing is that, that when I talked to Justin Kreutzman, he said that uh, Coppola would set up, went to Mickey's, wherever, they, and he, he showed the, the, the screening yeah, of right. the film and said, this is this part, and I want this kind of, of feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did part of it at, uh, well, well, he first showed them at Zoetrope, and then that we did it at Mickey's Barn, and then we finished it up at Club Front. But... Um, there was, uh, and, 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 and Mickey got quite a bit of latitude in terms of, of how to perceive it. And he tried a lot of different ideas, a lot was, uh, was discarded. Um, but people like Gregorico, and there were so many people, Zach Hirosain, um, um Jimmy Lovelace, I mean, I've interviewed I mean, all these just, cats, Vince Del... A cadre all... of fantastic players. Monsters. And not only that, but people that I came, became to be friends with for the rest of my life and stuff, you know, the people that I really fell in love with that came in, in, in the spirit of doing this. Nobody really got paid anything for it. I mean, it, it was nominal, maybe gas money or something, but everybody <laughs> really did it out of the love for it, you know, and it came together... Um, 
I was, I would have liked to have seen Coppola use more of it. He got caught between uh, the, the sort of conventional music track uh, done by, uh, was it Tiomkin? Uh, well, the only, the cat that I know is a different fur, Dr. Patrick Gleason, a brilliant cat, who was doing uh -huh. a lot of the stuff, he was doing a lot of the, of the music over there. Right, yeah. And then Mickey did, had sort of an offshoot thing uh, going right. on as well. So there was, so, and Coppola, if I have a correct. People want to see your mouth. Yeah. Pardon me? People want to see your mouth. Ah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Coppola was, uh, his, he, he was connected to Dmitry Tiamkin in a fam familial way. And so he, uh, he, that, the conventional music form, soundtrack was, he was, I think, under pressure to use a lot of that. Plus, I, I, I'm not sure that he was confident enough to, to take a, a departure, a reasonable departure. Um, um, from the conventions of movie making to use a lot more of Mickey's stuff. But some of the sounds, I, I, I know that were there that wound up on a, the so-called cutting room floor were just, I mean, hair-raising, outrageously, and so um, appropriate for the events that were going on in the movies as it happened. So I, I have to applaud Mickey for that, and uh, partially because of his creativity, but also partially because he got us all to do it. And, and, I, and I love him forever for that, you know. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's the truth. Um, Bill Putnam, did you learn from him, or he was just a, a, a sort of a, a... He was a mentor. A mentor. Can you explain, um, by the 70s and 80s, you were pretty well regarded as a sound legend, and you know, putting your ego aside for a minute, can you just talk about like, other peers of yours that you respected that were sound engineers, what they would say to you about what you were bringing to the table that, was, that made you, uh, some people would say Jake Feinberg's a legend, but what, what made you a legend as a sound creator? What made me a legend? You said by the 80s you were really pretty well known. And I, I'm just, I want for young, people well, that are gonna I, see this. Well, in for one thing, um, when I began, the engineers that were, were, that were, were sort of all employed in the, in the various fields, all of the studio engineers, all the movie engineers, all the live sound mixing engineers, were all kind of like my parents' generation. They were what I called um, World War II uh, Signal Corps people. They, a lot of them learned sound and, and from and the, and being in the, uh, in the military Absolutely. during the, 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 the Second World War and the Korean War and stuff. And they, they are, are, my parents' generation, because of World War II, bless their hearts, it was the greatest generation that ever lived, uh, they were kind of more of a marshalling. They had that sort of militaristic kind of, uh, of, of, of attitude and, and, and approach to life, um, very disciplined and very straight and stuff. So when we started, when he came into the studio smoking pot and taking LSD and, and turning up our amps and feeding them back in the studio, I mean, that just bottomed out that generation. And only a very few of them were able to, to, to uh, sort of overcome it or adapt or accept it or recognize it, okay, so this is not how I do it, but these, this, these kids are doing it this way and leave them alone. So uh, because of that, I got, a lot of resentment from when I would I would be hired to produce a record and engineer a record um, for one of the record companies. I would go into a studio, and then there's record companies in those days. They would book the studio time, and I, I I didn't really have that much say oftentimes in what studio I used. So I just had to use the studio that I was assigned to. But um, um, the engineers in those studios would would be this sort of uh, um, um, real staunch. Um, um, disciplined engineer and oftentimes their attitude was um, you know I, I don't really feel like I want you touching my console and stuff right you know? and so there was a certain amount of protectiveness about it and you, you got to understand that that's that's sort of a, a, to be expected I mean that's was their turf and they spent their life there and now they're being displaced by some little long-haired punk well you were that that you but you were hired for the gig and, though right I mean you were hired yeah, I was hired for the gig and you and, could it wasn't a union thing the, you could the, touch the, the board that hired me hired the studio and were paying the bills right so the owner of the studio was like I don't care what you think you let him in the studio right but that still didn't mean that they had to go and shake my hand and slap me on the back. No. And oftentimes it was like, you know, fuck you, kid. You know, in fact, I've been told that. Figure it out for yourself when I'd ask a question and stuff. But I also had other people that were just the opposite. They were very loving and very parental. 
and, and, and understood and treated me like their son whom they wanted to see succeed and stuff. And Bill Putnam was one of them, all right? And so instead of intimidating me and putting me off, he, he opened himself to me. And uh, in, in the case of Bill Putnam, when you finish a record album in those days, you have to cut it to the original master disc. There were no facilities in San Francisco that could do stereophonic records. Mm -hmm. There was a couple that could do mono, but and those were a little bit on the rickety side. Columbus Recording was one. Um, but to cut a good stereo master with good equipment, with state-of-the-art equipment, you had to go to L.A. So I went to L.A., and of course, Bill Putnam was the mastering engineer. And uh, that's my first encounter. I didn't even know who he was until I, I went there first time. And I didn't really know what I was doing. And so he took me under his wing and helped showed me how to cut the record and taught me along the way and was a, and, 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 and did a succession of other records after that for me, at which point I really got to know him really well and, uh, and learned a tremendous amount from him. So that's Bill Putnam for me. And I'll always forever be grateful for his help and, and his uh, mentorship and stuff. I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you gain the respect of... Candelario, Parrish. Uh, <laughs> I can, never gained those guys' respect. Well, let's be clear. You're bringing in the pickup, the, the, the countryman pickup. I mean, the, the, the wall of sound. Richard Loren was terrorized by them, okay? They treated him badly. He told me in the radio, they, <laughs> they would go to promoters and dump spaghetti on their heads. Candelario was a yeah. They were building this stuff on acid. So I'm just saying, like, they respected your knowledge, but also how did you get them, how did you crack the whip when they were dragging? Um... um... Just feed him more acid? <laughs> no, I never did any of that stuff. I was, in fact, against all of that stuff. Um, uh, I didn't dose people, and I didn't uh, subscribe to that. Uh, I guess, you know, more to the point, it was a labor of love. So how did you motivate them? Uh, I'll tell you, because I had knowledge. The one thing that those guys respond to is yep. I knew stuff that they didn't. They were there responsible for hooking up guitar amps, and I had no idea the input from the output. And I would help them without giving them any shit about it. And, and I sort of would come along behind them and help them out and pat them on the back and show them how to do stuff. And so they were grateful to me for that. Whether or not they kissed my ass or, 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 or it, it, don't think for a minute that they didn't give me a shit because any chance they could, they did. And it, there was, uh, it's a double-edged sword. They, it was a sort of a, a policing situation. It kept, it kept a lot of, of riffraff and a lot of distraction, I think is the better word, away from the Grateful Dead because of the intimidation. Richard only had a hard time because he, let, he, let a, he bought into it. If he had just said, fuck you guys, shut up, they would have, they wouldn't have had it. Right, so, maybe, yeah. So th it was one of those kind of things. I mean, you have to, you have to know. It's like a dog. If, you, if a dog senses fear, he's going to jump on you. <laughs> if he senses... He's going to attack you. You go, hey, yeah. sit down, shut up. The dog goes, oh, okay. All right, but it was so, knowledge. And when I talked knowledge, to... Knowledge, I think. Yeah, well, Dr. Ross Ziegler, Kreutzmann, was so, he was tight with him because as a doctor, he could answer questions right. for him. That, and so those guys got off on right. knowledge. Knowledge. You know, I think that any, anybody that... In, anybody it does. When you run into something that, that, that knows more about what you're doing than, than you do... You're, and, and, and is willing to be civil to you, you you're, you'd have to go out. Yeah, I'm not against analog recording either. But digital, the, the, the equipment and stuff is really progressed to the point of where uh, I, I love, I, I always dreamt of the ability to manipulate sound. Um, when I started out, when you were doing a mix, if you wanted to do serious crossfades and stuff, we would do in Grateful Dead albums, I've had times where I've had the whole band there and at different places it was different people with their hand on a fader and I'd say, at this point you do this, at this point you do this, and we would all do that stuff. And at best, the combination of that plus razor blades and tape, slicing tape, um, you could perform what was considered miracles in those days, but by today's standards that was like uh, barbaric sticks and stones. And I always <laughs> dreamt of, man, if I could just have somehow have the ability to just automate all of this or to have to, to, to be able to, to, to do all to do layers and layers and layers of stuff how great it would be and when computers first started happening um, 
the the concept of computers being used for sound that was like are you kidding right you know and computers were really for what for uh, missile guidance and for uh, IBM, data data, data consult, yeah, processing yeah, right, and all of that right, stuff right. right the whole concept that you would hook it up to a record board was like miles down the road right and so um, <laughs> I was one of the ones that was always like well why can't we you know if you can if that computer can do this why can't it do this and 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 the answer was as soon as you have handles on all of the things that you want to do that you can hook up, up to a computer to, then you'll be able to do it. So it just became a matter of enough time to develop uh, automated faders and automated EQ and software programming and so on and so forth. The first layer that was really, um, uh, the first huge big significance was automated mix now. Okay, so that where you could run a mix and you could run one fader and it would remember that, then you could wind back and then you go back and do another fader and you would do it over and over again until you laid enough layers on it that you had an auto, a full mix with all those hands represented the way you wanted and you could do each one until you got it just like you wanted it. Well, of course, it, you, there was diminishing returns and stuff. After about the sixth or eighth time, it would start forgetting the first few and stuff. Absolutely. So it was real iffy. But that was just a matter of time, and it eventually got farther and farther together, where now you can do infinite amounts of mixes, and you can throw that aside and start a second one and still keep the first one, and you can keep thousands of them if you want. So now the way it is, is if you can imagine it in your head, you can pull it off. If, you're, if you know enough about the software and the hardware and how it interfaces and how to work it, if you can think of it, you can make it happen. And that to me is, is that's euphoria. And that's it. I mean, that's, that's where, that, I, that was my dream 20 years ago, or 20 years before that started happening. So it, it all, um, I, I played only a small part in it. I, I did a lot of, of consulting in the early days of software and stuff. A lot of software writers and stuff would... would for me, I'm at a place in my life where uh, all of the people that I would like to play with, we all are, have other commitments and, have, and, uh, and gone in other areas, and it's a little more difficult for us to be able to get together and spend time together. Because the other thing is, is that when you get to where I am, you have to either play all the time or forget playing. But, no, you're you can't, that's it a isn't great just a call. It's a great thing. call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it winds up sounding like mush. You're not, yeah. you're not tight. You're yeah. not, you're not and together. So I, in order for me to satisfy myself and my friends to satisfy themselves, um, we we. We know too much, so we have to. You have to play enough that you can get past that bumbling around part of it. You know, which uh, you know, it's like anything else. You got to rehearse. You got you work in a yo-yo. You got to do it every day if you want to be. If you want to play. If you want to do a yo-yo really well, you know. But as far as what am I doing now? Um, I just got done working with a really great friend of mine who was a sound engineer, or an electronic engineer, I should say, uh, in ultrasound, Jeff Peters, uh, who is one of the fantastic mathematician and sound uh, and, and, and design guy. And the two of us took an idea and, and, and turned it into a piece of equipment which I'm, I'm just finishing up, in fact, earlier today. What, 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 is it, what inspires you what has been an inspiring, it doesn't have to be musical, what was an inspiring thing? You, 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 you've been inspiring cats your whole life with invent, inventiveness and industriousness and creativity. Uh, but can you talk about an inspiring moment for Dan Healy in 20, 2018 or an recently? An inspiring moment? Um, on a philosophical level, I'm inspired by any challenge, um, I, uh, any new ideas musically, new ideas electronically and so on and so forth. On a social level, I'm inspired by, uh, right now, one of my uh, goals, really uh, uh, one of my, uh, one of my, my, my brainchilds, uh, um, she was born in 1968. She's about ready to turn 50 this weekend. She was born on St. Patrick's Day. That's why I'm going to LA. It's her birthday. But um, she's a fabulous woman. You know, uh, uh, and she's done so much for the, rec the record industry and the music industry. And she, She's very active along those lines. Is it still an industry? Well, I think it is. Unless you want to call it a scam. Uh, birthday present as I turn. Oh, well, happy birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, one of these, uh, so you're a Pisces. Yeah, I'm a uh, absolute hardcore Pisces. You know, hardcore always Pisces. swimming upstream against the current. Um, but then when the jet stream goes, it yeah, goes. That's and, it, and, bluey, right? Well, 
and uh, uh, hello to Bill Kreutzman out there. Uh, can you tell the, the Bill, can you tell the, the the spoon story about Kreutzman playing the spoons? I uh, haven't. I already told that story. Yeah, about tell that another story. Tell no, you tell tell me. Tell you, okay. Yeah. Um, that's just one of the many Kreutzman stories. Uh, well, tell another tell another really really story. The spoons one no, was epic. I think the the the, the I. When he played with me in the Healy Trees band, um, he, it, it was good for him because it wasn't the Grateful Dead. He wasn't under the constraints of having to be Billy Kreutzman famous drummer or live up to whatever the Grateful Dead standards might be. And I was one of the ones that was pressing standards on the Grateful Dead just as much as anyone else was too. So it was a chance, and I think it was the reason why a lot of us got involved in spin, what we call spin-off bands, was as a chance to, to sort of be ourselves, you know? And um, that was, uh, it was really good for him. I saw a side of him that got to come out that I never saw in The Grateful Dead because- What uh, side was that? It, 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 isn't, it, it, does, it doesn't always allow you to just be casual, um, 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 uh, Joe Cool walking down the street. Um, you know, you, I can't even imagine. But with the Healy Trees, he was really able to... to, to he was just a loose, looser, open guy is all. And so he played, he did things musically that he, that he would probably felt...